Thank you. Call Jacinda Ardern. Thank you, Mr Chair. Mr Chair, we've had a lot of discussion about cost-benefit analysis. Um, and obviously, with uh, any significant legislative change, there's an expectation, not just because of the requirements around setting out regulatory impact statements, that at least some cost-benefit analysis is done. But it's really up to a minister and a department to factor in the range of issues that they would like to include in that cost-benefit analysis. And this, in this debate, an area that seems to be severely lacking in the minister's logic around the cost of having, for instance, included in the Residential Tenancies Amendment Bill standards around, for instance, heating or even including higher standards around insulation, does not factor in the cost to the state in their cost-benefit analysis of some of the issues around uh, living in cold and damp housing. So uh, I, would, I would actually really like to hear from the Minister what he consider, considers to be an adequate cost-benefit analysis, because he describes this bill as economically rational, when, for instance, the cost to the state of rheumatic fever for a child is between three hundred and five hundred thousand dollars. Now, obviously, uh, the government does consider that to be a cost worth mitigating, because why else would they have made it one of their better public service targets? They've implemented ways to screen by swabbing children for strep, treating children with antibiotics, but actually, if we were serious about prevention in this space, we would acknowledge that you can't pick up a child who's not at school because that's where the children are being swabbed. So if you really want to prevent uh, further incidences, you would look to the source, which is cold, damp, overcrowded housing. So I think it would make very good sense to include in a cost-benefit analysis the cost of the diseases of poverty and overcrowding but also those that are directly uh, influenced by... I would be, I'd welcome, then, if the Minister says they have, I would welcome, then, further detail on why it is that in his cost-benefit analysis, where we have over 40,000 children admitted to hospital per annum, it did not make economic sense in his mind to add, for instance, heating, in this instance, and higher standards around the, insulation, the because well, it, it, that does not make economic sense for the state to bear the burden of that cost, because the department has made an assumption uh, that if that went to a landlord, and I challenge this assumption, that if we required landlords to provide a source of heating, that they would automatically put that cost onto their tenants. I actually question that rationale. Alfred Naro has said that mum and dad investors are good, uh, are the people that we're talking about here who would be impacted by changes like that. I don't disagree with that. And that they want to be good landlords, and those are the people that we would be putting this cost onto who would naturally then pass it on. I question the decision-making there to assume that every single landlord would put that cost onto the tenant. I've been a tenant for most of my life living in properties outside of my family home. I have had continual upgrades to different properties I have lived in. Not once has that upgrade come at a cost where the, that landlord has said to me, I'm now, because I've made this adjustment to the property that you're in, I'm now going to charge you more immediately in your rent. I haven't had that experience. We have made an assumption here an assumption that we want the tenant to bear the brunt of poor quality housing because the trade-off is that they will be paying more. They're paying more because we have a housing crisis. Let's be clear on that. That is the reason tenants are primarily paying more. Why not have a requirement that landlords do right by their tenants? Because actually, I have a belief that there are a good number of landlords who would not necessarily pass that on. And for those who wouldn't, those who are the slum landlords, let's make them provide quality housing. What is wrong with that? Why should we, as a state, bear the burden of the cost on children being hospitalised whilst we allow 
landlords to get away with not providing quality housing. Why should we, Mr Chair? Denise Roche. Thank you, Mr Chair, I rise to take